Hello everyone, this is Ramesh Raskar at MIT. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk about augmenting health solutions, patient to population scale using augmented reality, AI and sensors. Now, everybody knows about this movie, right? This is Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Now what you'll notice here uh, is that Tom Cruise is very explicitly interacting with the screen. Right, uh, he know he has to think about the file servers. His gestures are, are very specific to move a file from one place to another, use his gestures to make changes to the file and so on. So he's thinking like, you know, a, a, a file system, how to interact with it and, and manipulate with that. If you compare that with a movie that came about 10 years later, the movie Her, uh, uh, Theo, in this case, has very implicit interaction with the world. You know, he just has, you know, headphones, he has his computer, and he has his uh, smartphone. That's it. Uh, and that's enough for him to interact uh, with the world. And he doesn't really have a notion of uh, his file systems. He's not making any explicit interactions and so on. And the difference is almost like Microsoft Windows versus Google. When you're searching something online on Google, you don't have an understanding of how Google has stored all that information uh, or how it's positioned. And you're not interacting with, with Google online with any explicit gestures. So it's kind of the Microsoft mindset on a desktop versus the Google mindset on the web is very different uh, when, it, when it comes around. And that's kind of the difference between explicit interaction in minority report and the implicit interaction uh, in the movie here. And how does that relate to augmented and virtual reality? In today's world, we are more like Tom Cruise than Theo uh, in how we're interacting in this augmented and virtual environments. Let's take another common example. You know, if you use Waze or Google Maps, uh, you know, uh, it allows us to understand uh, where how should you go from point A to point B? Uh, not because you have somehow, somehow have a smarter um, car or you have you know, a smart city system. It's only because Google sucks up the location of all of our, uh, all of our GPS locations from the cars. Uh, and it can very quickly show uh, where everybody else is and show the traffic uh, and show you know, that you should take one street or other by showing this greens and reds uh, on the screen. It allows you to get around because we know everybody who's ahead of us, how they're behaving and what challenges they're facing. So let's see how this maps to uh, augmenting surgeons uh, and in health systems. Uh, imagine a future where surgeons can have this multimodal interaction. Some of that is based on you know, head-worn devices, as you see here in drawn in, in purple. Some of it is on, you know, traditional screens in the back, LCD screens, as you can see. You can dial in a nurse, which is shown here in the pink. Uh, and they have all these tools. And you also notice that the room doesn't have very complicated, you know, other setups. Uh, everything is set up in, in the ceiling. The ceiling is made up of cameras and projectors and multispectral light sources. Uh, and it's kind of all been removed, all the clutter of lights and interactions have been cluttered. So the surgeons can really focus on what they have to do. In addition, they can see options uh, of what exactly the surgery would look like. Should I take option A or option B or option C? So what does this, what does this future look like? We, in any AR or VR systems, we have to think about three sub-problems. How do you capture, how do you analyze, and how do you interact? And just like Waze, uh, you know, we can, the surgeons could have information of millions of other surgeries that have been done before them, bring those surgeries video in and create a library of complications. In case of Waze, it's a library of uh, traffic jams. It's a library of com uh, complications. And then analyze, using computer vision and machine learning, natural language processing, tips, anomalies, and so on. And then finally, you can interact with it with augmented reality, haptics, you know, multimodal screens 
uh, and so on. Uh, and it's not just about augmenting what you're doing, but also understanding how the surgeons themselves, you know, how their brain activity, their eye, voices, context, and action can be understood uh, as well. So this neurocognition uh, assessment is very important and virtual and augmented reality uh, is playing a key role. Uh, here's, I'm just showing an example from a company, React Neuro, where I'm an advisor. Uh, and so augmented reality is not just for seeing what's out there, but it's also a way to understand what's going on for the surgeons themselves and understanding their neurocognition as well. So in that sense, virtual and augmented reality is not a display device, but it's also a capture device because the sensors and cameras and, and gyros that are in the head mounted device is also capturing information about the person who's wearing it. Uh, and one, one could argue companies like Google and Facebook, uh, you know, make billions of dollars, not because they're using browser as a display medium by showing the content, but most of the information they capture are they're treating browser as a capture medium. You know, which click links you have clicked, how long you have hovered, you know, how you have liked particular things. And they're using browser as an input to understand the user and then sell them services and show them ads and so on. So we're also going to go through this very interesting shift in, in VR and AR where the device is not a display device, but it's actually a capture device in this case for neurocognition assessment. So when you think about augmented surgeon beyond the X-ray vision using this multi-mode AR. So on the left, you have the traditional mindset of a, there's a head-worn device and you're going to see some kind of an X-ray vision. On the right is the notion of a multimodal interaction. Uh, in this case with projectors and my PhD thesis, you know, almost 20 years ago uh, was about using projectors for augmented reality. So we have to get away from this obsession that augmentation can only happen with head-worn devices. In reality, it's going to be multimodal. So when you think of augmented reality, you think about the world, you're going to uh, input it and we're going to sense beyond human ability. Uh, and then we're going to abstract and present within the human comprehensibility back to the world. And that's our mental model of how augmented reality works. Um, and for input, we're going to use cameras and location and sensors. For processing, we're going to identify, track, you know, make it more abstract. And then finally for output, we have displays and overlay, and all of this is through interaction. Now, currently, when we talk about an AR and VR, we are obsessed with the display aspect of it. And as I said earlier, it's just not just about the display. And even within display, we are obsessed with resolution, field of view, frame rate, optics, and so on. And what we're trying to do is we know that none of these parameters are actually going to allow us to create you know, the perception, the, you know, a photorealistic perception of what's out there. Uh, because the physics is just not our friend when it comes to all the physical parameters. So we're looking for those dips in the perception and see how our physics of our devices can just slightly overcome that so we can create a, a meaningful perception. And this is to me is very frustrating. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was doing my PhD in North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, in AR and VR, you know, I, I got into the field because of Jurassic Park. It's like, wow, if you can augment the virtual uh, the scenes with virtual dinosaurs, you know, you can probably do a lot of other things. Uh, and then near the end of my PhD, I, you know, I started watching South Park and that just completely changed because if you think about South Park versus Jurassic Park, I mean, South Park, there are no photorealism, the shadows are not right, the shapes are not right, the motion is not right. But one could argue that South Park is much more enjoyable, much more interesting than Jurassic Park, right? And so that's the struggle we have, that it's not always about photorealism, but it's also about functional realism. It's about the storytelling aspect of it as well. And that's why some of the research I did later on is not focusing on photorealism, 
but so-called functional realism. In this case, a non-photorealistic camera that can directly create something that's more comprehensible uh, and more easy to understand. So this notion of realism, whether it's non-visual, which is could be just storytelling, functional, which could be this cartoon representations, photoreal and physical realism. And I know we have been obsessed with this top right part of it, uh, but Jim Forward and others have been talking about this distinction between different types of realism and should AR and VR focus on photorealism and above or below uh, is, is an open question. And the reason why functional realism hasn't taken off is the neuroscience of what it means to be together and be there, you know, is, is pretty archaic. Uh, in our experience, we have seen most of the research in neuroscience is based on, uh, you know, some specific assumptions of what it means to be there. Uh, and there are very few data sets that allows us to do this research uh, as well. So going back to how surgeons work, as you'll see from this picture, is extremely multimodal in terms of the devices they use, in terms of the displays they use, in terms of the other uh, you know, sensor inputs they have, is extremely multi-format and multimodal. And it will be a mistake to make VR and AR using a simple mode, which is some kind of a head-worn solution. And in addition, the ecosystem of, of, uh, of AR and VR requires integration with IoT devices, you know, thinking about the ergonomics and hygiene, have a gesture language and so on. So there are many aspects to make AR and, and VR right. So again, beyond the input and output, uh, we have to worry about authoring, data sets, IoT, multimodal, multi-format, gesture languages, you know, ethics, even how do you deal with people who are wearing eyeglasses, right? Uh, and so throughout my research, uh, you know, I've been working in many of these areas. Uh, as you know, I took a sabbatical leave and I was at Oculus uh, as, as a lead architect. And one of the points I con constantly made was that, let's get into a multimodal, multi-format world out there. So multimodal AR, uh, when you want to augment a real object, you have many options, you know, something that can be done you know, very close to your eyes, uh, something at arm's length, something far away in the room, or in some case, you know, uh, for the object directly. Uh, and this could be a retinal display, head-mounted display, handheld display, or spatial see-through display, or what we call shader lamps, you know, that comes directly on top of this object. So we wrote a book on uh, spatial augmented reality uh, with Oliver Bimber, that many, many of you may have read, but that part of, was part of my PhD thesis about 22 years ago. And when you think about augmentation, one of the great examples is the vein viewer, where you know, here I am uh, you know, able to just put my hand underneath this vein viewer, which has a coaxial IR camera that can see my veins, but has a projector that's projecting on my hand in a green color. So it becomes very easy for you know, a, a nurse to find the vein and uh, for, for injections and, and, and so on. And this notion of shader lamps, which are lamps, which are projectors that are providing sh shading information. Uh, and with that, you can do a lot. You can create virtual motion, uh, you can create interactions, virtual reflectance, virtual illumination. On the top right, you have a, 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 you know, a neutral colored white model of, of Taj Mahal uh, but by using projectors, we're able to add texture to it uh, and create illusions of illumination change and motions and vibrations uh, and all of those things. Uh, so the multimodal aspect of augmented reality uh, is very critical. And the other way to think about this, you know, some of my colleagues uh, here, uh, Rob and, and, and Ben and Bill, often remind us that people are lazy, you know, as much as it looks cool that Tom Cruise is standing in front of this big screen in Minority Report to move these things. You know, that's, that's have a huge cognitive load of keeping mind where everything is and also physical exertion. And if there's fatigue, people are not gonna use those interactions and AR VR systems. So we have to keep in mind that people are lazy and create solutions that are more like the movie Her and Theo that have very implicit, implicit uh, interactions. So what does it mean to create ways for surgeons? Uh, you know, there's decision-making, there's sharing tips, 
there's training, there's finding anomalies. So let's dig deeper, a little bit deeper uh, into this. So first of all, as I said, you can step back and add these projectors and cameras in the ceiling that are constantly scanning the world in real time, augmenting it. And the augmentation can come through the projectors, through the head-worn displays, or through the screens that, that are already uh, in the room. Right? Uh, and as I said earlier, the capture, analysis, and interaction uh, in, 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 these, in these setups uh, become the key problem uh, for us to solve. So let's look at some of these problems. So as I said, AR and VR is not just about display, it's about capture. Uh, and I would argue that capture is a much bigger opportunity than display. So we should start obs obsessing about field of view, resolution, and frame rate, and so on. And also, uh, artificial intelligence is very different from intelligence amplification. And intelligence amplification would beat AI at any moment because in intelligent ampli intelligence amplification, it's the synergy, the symbiosis between the human brain and the computer brain. So let's think about these three buckets, capture, analyze, and interact. And any digital system over time goes through three phases, improve, transform, and disrupt. So in the beginning, you can imagine that such AR systems like Waze for Surgeons uh, on capture, you know, you have video and haptics and on-site diagnostic tests using AR. In terms of analyze, it's sharing tips with other surgeons, you know, avoiding waiting uh, and so on. And in terms of interaction, uh, you know, we can train doctors, you know, very rapidly, you know, some surgeons can become Olympians and become very smart or one, senior surgeon can manage a team of other surgeons without being there physically. Uh, but over time, we're going to transform the field of surgery as well in terms of capture. We'll capture the library of complications, millions of surgeries done before. Analyze, we can find the anomalies early and also predict what could happen after the surgery is done uh, and interact with the surgery, not just with the scalpels and the tools, but also with speech. And then some interaction, you know, we might be able to handle comorbidities. Uh, that, uh, that's what makes the surgeon's job very difficult because, you know, as they're doing the surgery, mm -hmm. they have to have a knowledge of what potential complications could be, what are some comorbidities for this individual. But while interacting with this, you know, augmentation of multimodal augmentation, and then that's what we need a display and haptics. But how are we going to really disrupt? the field of surgery through AR and VR. So let's take a step back and think about different types of omics. You know, there's expososome, there's epigenome, there's microbiome, there's metabolome, there's proteome, there's transcriptome and genome. You know most of this, but there's a new one, anatome, which is about the anatomy. It's about the structure, the function, the development, the evolution and network of different bodily parts. And if you can create an anatome, then that would start, this is a, a dictionary that allows us to represent anatomy by structure, function, development, and evolution. And that's what would allow surgeons to see through a, a, an augmentation device and detect the anatome so any of the other interactions uh, can be done. So if you have the anatome, uh, you know, recorded at cellular level or a, a, or a mesoscopic level, then we can start capturing in real time during the surgery and before, you know, the cellular level multispectral understanding of those anatomical parts. You can have a remote capture or a distant capture. You don't have to be right in contact with it. In terms of analysis, we can do population health uh, analysis across the surgical patients. Uh, and we can see when a surgeon is working on one particular patient, how the patient compares with millions of other patients that have been already analyzed before um, and, uh, and, and sliced by you know, uh, demography, age, ethnicity, and so on. And then when we have this anatomical structure library, this dictionary of anatoms, that will become you know, the fundamental building block for how AR interacts with surgery. 
And then in terms of interaction, it also becomes a precision health. It's a guided option, as you saw in the cartoon earlier, which is in real time, we can provide the feedback to the surgeon of what the next step should be. And this is like the ways for surgeons, which is instead of taking the traditional route, you know, ways might ind indicate to you that you should take this detour because there could be a complication if you take the traditional route. And this is the kind of guidance, you know, surgeons would benefit from. And of course, you know, surgeons have to spend, you know, thousands of hours to become a, an expert at a particular surgery. But if you have these type of ways for surgeons, it's like going into a new town uh, and not knowing any of the streets, but just a Google map or ways allows you to navigate through the town. Same thing, surgeons should be able, able to do novel surgeries without significant training. You know, maybe they may be able to just do this training in, in simulation and then go in the wild and be able to directly work on, on a patient. So significantly to reduce the amount of special training required for this, which means in developing countries in resource constraint conditions, you know, we can get surgeons and medical professionals up and running very quickly, although most of the training is actually happening in simulation at an extremely low cost. So just to tell you a little bit about my own group uh, at MIT, uh, our motto is to make the invisible visible um, inside our bodies, around us and beyond. And we also think about capture, analysis, and interaction uh, for us. Um, so in terms of capture, we are building a new type of a tricorder where we can look under the skin, uh, maybe at five to 10 micrometer resolution. This is a large project with NSF or create new types of endoscopes uh, that can create cellular level, uh, cellular resolution imaging, or we're building cameras that can see around corners uh, beyond line of sight. In analysis, we're creating new types of machine learning, which we call auto ML, uh, that can make invisible visible, privacy preserving machine learning that can make invisible data visible, uh, and many aspects of machine learning and computer vision and motion tracking. And then finally, in terms of interaction, uh, some of you might know the work from Matt Hirsch uh, from our group, where you have 8D telehealth and haptics, which is uh, you might be able to create a screen for remote uh, you know, uh, uh, health analysis where the, the, the doctor can look at the patient, not just by, not just by you know, changing their viewpoint, uh, but literally shining a light and the light would shine on the patient on the other side. And they can zoom in and shine light. And that's why it's eight dimensional because you have two dimensions of screen, two dimensions of being able to uh, change your viewpoint, but you also have additional four dimensions for the light itself. Uh, and so this eight dimensional light field, if you can capture and display, then telehealth can be transformed uh, dramatically. I want to thank uh, my group members at MIT from the Camera Culture Group. I want to thank my collaborators at Stanford University, uh, Lee Sanders and Carla Pugh, uh, and also my collaborators at Harvard, Raj Gupta and from Singularity, Dan Kraft. Uh, and many folks who have helped me uh, think through these ideas for augmentation for, for surgeons, as well as my colleagues from Mitsubishi Electric who worked with me for Shared Labs, uh, and of course my team from my PhD thesis uh, at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. Now, some of you might say, we understand why intelligence amplification is more important than artificial intelligence, but what if we don't need the symbiosis between human machines. What if there is a robot that can do everything? The robot can do actuation and can do, use AI to do full-fledged surgeries. And clearly you're a fan of Prometheus, the movie, where as you can see on the bottom right, you know, a robot can do a full-fledged surgery. Well, we are very far away from getting there. I think we are very far away from even changing the way surgeons uh, do their surgeries right now because I can't imagine a system in the near future, next five or 10 years, where we can replace, you know, the very skilled hands uh, of surgeons. So at this stage, it's more about augmentation and it's not about, you know, robotic surgeries like, like, uh, like Prometheus. So to conclude, uh, we think we need artificial, so we need augmented reality for intelligence amplification. AR 
for IA. And that's how we're going to go from patient scale, how surgeons are interacting with one patient at a time, to a population scale, that they understand millions of other surgeries that have been done before, and they can interact with either one patient or multiple patients at the same time. Patient scale to population scale. And for that, we need not just augmentation of the world, but you also need the neurocognition of how the doctors are thinking and even possibly how, how patients are thinking. We want to augment the surgeons. And I use this analogy of ways for surgeons that they would allow them to share tips, you know, dramatically simplify training, find anomalies. And you really want to build technology that gets you in and out of OR in the shortest possible way. And then I talked about this idea of precision health versus population health for surgery. If you create these new structures, these new dictionaries called anatome for human anatomy that can have a library of structure, function, development, and evolution that will allow surgeons to predict complications and handle comorbidities in real time. It's very much like you see those Hollywood movies uh, you know, when the, where the lead character has say, should I cut the red wire or should I cut, you know, the green wire? Uh, and imagine if you had experiences that are streamed in from millions of surgeries before, uh, you know, we can imagine that surgeries, surgeons can start doing even novel surgeries without significant special training. Um, so I think we have a glorious decade ahead for AR and for VR but I hope we'll stop obsessing with head-worn uh, limitations of augmented reality. I hope we'll go beyond displays and start thinking about many of these devices as capture solutions. And although I have used the example of surgeons for augmented reality, this is one of the most complex tasks. This little, we're literally talking about life and death uh, challenges here uh, in terms of using technology uh, in this situation. So if you can use that mental model of how can we create AR for surgeons, you know, every other problem is probably going to be much simpler than that. Thank you very much.